There are things which I like to talk about. The first thing is that the word. The word is extremely important. The power of the word is, a, is an unlimited power. Things can happen in a tremendous and a glorious way. The power in God's sight, it is the center of the universe. For Jesus is the word, is called the word himself. For he is the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And therefore the word is important. I remember in my days when if you shook hand and said to somebody something, you could, sell, you could sell a house or a car or whatever it was, and you knew that you had made the business and the thing was done. Today, of course, if you shake hand with somebody and say, yes, I'll sell you my house for such and such, you have to go to the solicitor and then you have to go to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Nobody believes your word anymore. But the word is still alive. And that is one of the reasons why the world doesn't believe into the word, but the word is still alive. He is still the center of the universe. He is still the most important thing. And Jesus said in Matthew, said like this, Verily I say unto you, that whatsoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and he shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatever you have said. And therefore the power is still, the, uh, the word is still powerful and it can still make things happen. And I believe as Christians we have to learn and realize that when we use our words, we use our words for good and we use our words for the glory and for the kingdom of God. Never be or use your words for discouragement, for discouragement. Never use your words for negativeness because those kind of things, they will come upon you. They are not of God. God is not a negative God. He's a positive God. The devil is negative, but God is positive. And therefore, whatever that is in God, it is yea and amen. And it's going to happen and it's going to come to pass. I remember uh, when you are a preacher for many years, there are times when you went through the fire, times when you go through a very hard time in your life. There are times when things become so hard that you will say to yourself, I'm going to sit down going to do anything anymore, I'm going to retire. Regardless if I'm young or my old, I'm going to retire. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to be able to enjoy and let somebody else do the job. I'm going to sit down there. Now then I realized that there was a man older than me in the Word of God that did exactly the same thing. He said one day, what I see I don't like. People don't listen anymore. They are not coming to uh, listen to the Word of God. They are not listening to anything, no matter what I say. They are not taking any notice to what I say. So he said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit down and I'm not going to say anything anymore. You know who he is? Uh, Jeremiah. And he sat there and he said, I'm not going to do anything anymore. But you see, if you have been filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God is in your heart and in your life, you can sit there as long as you want. You can say that you're going to retire. You can say that you're not going to speak anymore. But that fire which is in your bones is still going to move. And Jeremiah said, the fire came into my bones. My bones came alive and I couldn't stop anymore. I had to get up and preach the word of God. You want to retire? I hope you can. I can't. It doesn't seem to be able, it doesn't, that doesn't exist. But sometimes discouragement makes you think that you want to retire. Therefore, we must be very careful with the words that we say. There are things that are important in life. And in a church life, there are things that are even more important. The first thing that we have to realize is that the church will not survive and do well unless Jesus is in the midst of them. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the mix. And therefore, if he's not in the mix, things are not going to happen. Things are not going to work. 
We can shout, we can yell, we can sing until we have no more voice. We can jump up and down until we get so tired that we get down to the floor. We can do all kinds of things, but unless Jesus is there, nothing is going to happen. It is only when Jesus is present that things are going to happen. In Matthew chapter six, uh, 17, verse 16, there was a man who came to the disciples because he had a sick a person in his family. He came to the disciple and said, please cure him, pray for him, do something for him. They brought it to him and the disciples could do nothing. Why? Because Jesus was somewhere else. They were over here, Jesus was over there. They could not heal him. Then my friend, I can't heal anybody unless Jesus is there. And the uh, uh, Pastor Neil cannot heal anybody unless Jesus is there. And when Jesus is there, then things become to happen. And the Bible tells us that when they brought that boy to Jesus, he was healed instantly because Jesus was there. Without Jesus, we can't do nothing. Without Jesus, we cannot be, we are not able to move or to do and to say things that we would like to say. Jesus presence, it is important. I'm always think about those three boys. In the Old Testament, in the Daniel days, those three boys who were dedicated their lives to serve God, they wanted to do the right thing for the right, for the right cause, and suddenly they found themselves in despair. The king and the whole kingdom uh, and the powerful emperor uh, came against them. They took him, they chained him, they put him into the uh, uh, fiery furnace, and there they were, they, 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 there they were, the fire was all around them, but they had made up their mind. We are not going to deny our God. We are not going to bow to anything else because we are serving God and God alone. That is an important thing that we have to have in our minds. Suddenly, as they were walking in, the, in the, walking in the fire, isn't that nice to be able to walk in the fire and not being born, uh, burned? And there they were walking in the fire and they were not being burned. And the king looked over the fire mouth at the, at the furnace and he looked at he said, didn't we put there three people? And they said, oh yes, we did. We put there three people. He said, how come I see four of them now? Jesus was there. When Jesus is there, the fire is quenched. And no matter what trouble or problem we are going through, if we Jesus is in our life, things will be transformed and changed. Jesus come. Yes, he does come. How do we know we, that he comes? He will, he, he will uh, announce himself. Jesus doesn't come just saying, okay, I got nothing else to do, so I'm coming over there this morning. He doesn't do that way. Jesus will announce himself. He know, you know, when Jesus is coming. And he comes at the right moment for the right time. The Bible tells us, that angels are the announcer of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, brother, he said, I saw angels in the church. That excites me because a few months back, I saw angels in our church right here that were uh, surrounding the place over there. That excites me because when angels are coming, that means that Jesus is not far away. He's coming in. And my, fr my friend, if we persist in believing in God and believing and wanting to do the will of God and the things of God, if the angels are coming, they are looking forward word and Jesus will be coming right in the midst of them. I just don't want just an hour another movement of the Holy Spirit. I want Jesus to come and to be present in our mix so that wherever we go people will know that we have been with Jesus. Somebody the other day told me there is a big revival going on in Australia and you know you don't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about it. But there are thousands, thousands of people who are being getting saved 
saved and filled with the Holy Spirit right up in the northern part of Australia. And for, uh, unfortunately enough, it's happening among the Aborigines. And I couldn't figure out, nobody ever said anything to us. But then I went into Google and I began to go, I like Google. And I began to look, it's a look into it. And in Google tells me that 1,000 people were saved by the power of God. That's how Google say it. 1,000 people were saved by the power of God. And one of the elders prayed for a, uh, for a man that was dead and he came alive. My friend, those things are happening and they are happening now. That means that Jesus is coming. And when Jesus comes, things will change. I expect Jesus to come in our mix. I expect Jesus to come right in our church. Why in our church? Because I am selfish. I want to see Jesus and I want to see him right here. And I, I believe that I'm right when I say that I am selfish. When Jesus comes, things will come and have been changed. When does Jesus come? He comes right at the right time. I told you the story of the family that I know. The old lady, she used to come to our, our uh, house meeting in my father's place. And she, every time she comes, she get up and testify. And she said, last night I slept on the stairs because my family is against me. They, they say that I have renounced our religion and therefore they are ostracizing me. Another time she came and she had bruises all over her face and her body. And she said, I was beaten by my husband and my, and my daughter as well. She helped and she would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. But she kept praying that God would save them somehow, some way, in some way, in some way. The war was over. Revi the revival came upon the country. And she finally she died. The Lord took her home. The Catholic Church will not do the, uh, the, uh, the honor of doing the funeral because she was not a Catholic any longer. And therefore, nobody wanted her in that particular uh, environment. And so she had to have her, her uh, uh, funeral within the, within the uh, Pentecostal Church. That day, the whole church that knew her, they were all there at the funeral. The church was full to capacity for 500 people. The husband and the, and the daughter and the, grand, uh, the grandson and the son-in-law, they were there. They were sitting in the front and they were amazed how so many people were actually in love with their family, with their own mother and, uh, and, and uh, with their own mother. And so they sat there. The preacher came and he began to preach a message of hope, a message of, a message of hope before the presence of God. The congregation began to uh, respond and some of them were, uh, some of them were uh, tearful and some were uh, just praising God. At the end of the service, the husband and the daughter and the son-in-law and the grandson, all of which was the whole family, they stood up. They came up to the front and they said, We are so sorry, O Lord, for what we have done to our father, to our mother, and, 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 and so, Lord, we want you to forgive us. And they raised their hands and tears came to their eyes and they began to ask God for forgiveness. And when the Italians do something, they're very emotional and they became very emotional and the whole church became very emotional. You can understand that. And everybody was crying before the presence of God and that day uh, the, that day the whole family gave their heart to the Lord she always believed that God was going to save her family and every time she would stand up and testify she would say regardless of what I know that God is going to save my family and one day we are going to worship God all together unfortunately she went home before the time but those people are still uh, those people are still serving God and doing the thing that God wants them to do. They're trying to make up for the time that they have lost because they have now accepted Jesus. And when Jesus is present, things will change in the life of anybody. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 20, there is a woman who was in despair. Desperation had come to their life. 
She has spent every penny that she had for doctors, and doctors could not heal her. They couldn't do a thing about her. There are certain things, you know, my friend, I realize that there are doctors and hospitals that are trying to do everything that they can, and they do the best, and God bless them. Some of them are such wonderful, great people, and they're doing a tremendous job. But there are some times when they themselves cannot do it. And you have to realize and rely completely on the hand and on the answer. Prayer and your faith before the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes, things will change, my friend. And here is this woman. She was spent all of her money. She spent all of their time searching for healing in her body. She had an issue of blood. Could not stop. She was dying, and, the day, and, and only death was staring at her face. She said, one day, I'm going to see Jesus. Oh, what a beautiful time. I'm going to see Jesus. I like to wake up in the morning and say, today, I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to have a little talk with Him. I'm going to be with Him. I'm going to spend some time with Him. And this woman said, I'm going to see Jesus because I am in despair. I have no hope. Hope, and therefore, I have to do something. She went, and my friend, sometimes we think that when we go to Jesus, everything is easy. Everybody's there. Everybody's there to help you out. And everybody said, oh, come on, let's on. Let us do. Come on to Jesus. She didn't find it that way. She found that there were problems. There were troubles there. There was a crowd of people that was surrounding Jesus, and she could not come into his, she could not come to his presence and ask him to heal her. So she began to fight. I'm here now. I'm only facing death. I'm going to fight this crowd. I'm going to go close to Jesus as much as I could. Uh, suddenly she was at the third line or the second line. There were still people around. She stretched the hand and touched the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, when you touch Jesus, your life is changed. When you touch Jesus, your problems are solved. When you touch Jesus, you are healed. When you touch Jesus, things are going to happen. And I am hoping that as the angels are coming in our midst, that Jesus will come and things will happen. She did. You know the story. She got healed. You know the story. There was another man. He was very, I like him because he, he was kind of forward type of a person. He was one of those disciples that was always ready to jump into the pot, regardless if he get fired or not. But he would do something. There they were in a boat. They were crossing the sea. Big storm came. They became afraid. Then they saw somebody coming by. And they recognized it wasn't a ghost, but it was Jesus. And somebody said, Jesus is walking on the water. And Peter said, Lord, if it is you, ha ha, let me come. I want to come close to you. Well, the waves were there. The water was there. Jesus was over there. And Peter had to go from here to over there. And Jesus said, okay, Peter, come on. So Peter jumped out of the boat and he started running on the water to get close to Jesus. Suddenly he began to sink. You know why? Because he was walking on water. He had suddenly wasn't looking at Jesus that was there in front. He wanted to go, but the water was there. It was a hindrance for him to be able to come. But suddenly he came and Jesus helped him. And they had a nice, beautiful Holy Ghost revival jumping up and down on the water. My friend, you might have to, before you see Jesus, you might have like Peter, you might have to walk on the water, but it's worthwhile walking in the water. The problems might come. The waves might be rolling all over the place. But my friend, when you come face to face to Jesus, 
things are going to change. I believe that Peter never forgot that experience. And when he was dying or whatever, he still remember that he walked on the water and he saw Jesus. Oh, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. And then sometimes I think I haven't walked on water now, a, a bodily type of water to be able to go to Jesus. But my friend, you know and I know, if you look in your life and you see your time and your experience, many times before you came to Jesus, you have to walk to the troubled water of this world before you were able to come and touch the hem of his garment. How many times you have to do that? Many, many times. But every time that you did it, it was rewarding. Jesus was there and he was helping. Then, of course, what about Lazarus? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. They couldn't believe that Jesus was, the, they, they thought that everything was lost. Mary and Martha, they said it very clear to the Lord. He said, Lord, if you were here, my son, my brother would have been alive, but you were not here, now he's dead. And uh, Jesus said, well, he will be resurrected. And Martha and Mary said, oh, of course, I know the resurrection of the body. That time will come. He said, but from now until then, we are going to be widows. The heart, my brother, is not going to be here from now and then. And Jesus said, don't you know that I am the resurrection and the life? That is what we have to believe with the bottom of our heart. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And the life. And with that moment and that day, in the front, in front of all so many people and so many educated people, Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb and he made alive it again and he brought it back to his sister. What a wonderful thing. Wouldn't you like to see somebody be resurrected by the power of God? I would. I would love with the bottom from the bottom of my heart to see somebody that is dead and be alive. I would have liked to be up to that, uh, that reservation up there in the north when that elder prayed for that old that uh, for uh, his grandson whoever he was in this in, in in his place and he was dead and suddenly he prayed and he came alive i would love to see something like that maybe i will never be able to see it maybe maybe but i still believe i believe that when the angels come jesus is following just right in the front just in the back and Jesus is the resurrection, and Jesus is the life. If we believe in him, Jesus said to Mary and Martha, do you believe that? And after today, I would like to answer to myself and to you, do we believe that? Do we believe that he's a resurrection and the life? Do we believe that he can do all of these things and when he is present? If we do, my friend, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. The Bible tells us that it's going to happen again. At the end of time, when the time will come to an end, when the decision is made in heaven by God, this is the time that, you, this is the time that my people will come back to me. The Bible says, angels are coming again. You know that angels are always there. Let me talk about them for a minute. It was angels that came to Abraham and said, let us tell Abraham, our friend, what we are going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels told him, and they knew, and Abraham knew, and he had a chance to be able to pray for God to spare that city. There was an opportunity in there for Abraham to do. It was uh, an angel that came to a young lady called Mary, in the middle of uh, uh, in the middle of the Middle East, there he came and he said, "Mary, he said, God has chosen you, and He has chosen you. You're going to bear a child, and that child shall be the savior of the world. You shall call him Jesus." And she said, "But how, how can I?" And uh, but the angel was the announcer that Jesus was coming by the way of Mary. Jesus was coming into the world. Then Jesus came again, he had, uh, then the angel came again. There was another, the man, which was the betrothed of Mary. He was in despair. He was in trouble because according to the law, he had to throw the first stone and have Mary killed. He didn't know what to do. And he began to cry out to God. An angel come and appeared to him again. I like when the angels come. And he said, and he said to Joseph, don't worry, Joseph. This is the will of God. 
And so Joseph looked up and he said, if this is the will of God, I'm going to raise my hands and I'm going to praise God and I'm going to glorify the name of the Lord. The angels came again. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, with the day in Bethlehem, when the day when Jesus was born. Guest friend, who came to tell the world that Jesus was coming in the world? He, that was the angels. The Bible tells us that angels came from heaven. When they came, to came to few a couple of shepherds who were half asleep and half awake. He came and woke them up. And he said, wake up, man, because today in your town, it is born the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Wake up, angels again. They came to an announce and my friend one of these days angels are going to announce the coming of the Lord once again the Bible tells us the angel will sound the trumpet the trumpet will sound yes sir Yes, sir. Who sound them? The angels are doing it. And when the angels sound the trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise first. I don't know why the dead in Christ have to be first. But one, the reason is, uh, I believe that the reason is because they have proven their faithfulness to the end. They died believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they now their body was completely gone. They didn't have to be translated. All they had a new body. It was coming to them again. It was coming to them. So they were first. The angels announced it. The dead in Christ were first. Because they had already done their, uh, proven their, uh, uh, their allegiance to the Lord until the end. Then we who are alive. Aha. Uh -huh. How come we have to come third? Why not first? We are third. Reason is because, oof, every time we talk to somebody, I got a headache here. I got a pain on my neck. Oh, I got my back, it hurts. Oh, my knee, oh, I can't stand my knee. All of this, I have this to do and I have that, the other thing to do. We have so many things that the Holy Spirit has to unload us of all of those things. Then we receive the new body. No more headaches, no more problems, no more bills, no more taxes. <laughs> well, glory, no more problems because all things are going to be changed. And my friend, the angel first, the dead in Christ was second. We who are alive will be third. And together we will be caught up into the air. And guess what? We are going to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. For in the same way that he went, the same way he's going to come back again, we are going to meet him over there. And together he's going to bring us before the Father and say, Father, these are those who believed in me. And they have been faithful. Now, here they are. They're yours. You give it to me, but I'm bringing it back to you. And the peace, complete peace, is made between God and man. Angels, wonderful thing. If angels start appearing in our mix, my friend, I'm waiting for the second wave. I'm waiting for Jesus. I would love to see Jesus walk right through the door, come right into the middle. You know, wherever two or three are gathered together, Jesus in the midst of them. How many believe that? Let me see if you believe it. Wherever two or three are gathered together, that means that Jesus is here. Mm. We don't see him. That's not his fault. Not his fault. It's our fault. That's why we don't see him. Maybe we haven't heard the angels sound the trump yet. But he's here in our mix. What are we going to do with him? Are we going to go home and say, okay, nice, nice service. We go home and all is finished. Or are we going to say, Lord, we believe in you. We want to take you with us wherever we go so that your glory be manifested wherever I go. God bless you.